Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 207, Back to the Beginning. Well, I have to admit that over the past couple of years, I haven't been posting as many episodes, and I want to really uh, give back to the community that have been supporting me over these years. So what I want to do is go back to the very beginning to episode one, have you listen to it again, and then I'm going to come on at the end of the episode and tell you about some of the things that I've learned in the past 10 plus years. It's going to be 11 years at the end of April that I've been doing the Russian History Podcast. Uh, there's been so much new stuff that I've... Un- now, moving ahead, we had some problems between the Byzantines and the Hazars. I mean, they were always working together, but then there was a new group that would come down. And this is from the land of the Rus, and we've talked about this, and that's the Varangian Guard. These are the Varangians who came from the north, including Rurik. They would go down, and they would start having their wars with the Hazars around 860 to 880. And this, when Kievan Grand Prince Sviatoslav finally defeated the Hazars, this was the end of that. And they would linger around the people's until about the Mongol invasion, but that was about it. So that's what I've learned so far. When we come to the next episode, episode two, uh, and it's including Vladimir the Great, I really was remiss in saying a lot about him. I've had a lot more information about Vladimir, and that's what we're going to be adding on to the next one. And I'm hoping that on the 10th and the 20th of each month, I'll come up with another one of the episodes. So I hope you enjoyed that. And of course, as always, Dasvidanya i spasiba Bolshoya. Coming podcasts to enrich your knowledge of this vast and incredible peoples through their rulers. My interest in Russian history came from two people, with the first being my mother Alla and her family, who emigrated first from Russia through St. Petersburg, where they lived, then through Yugoslavia, and finally to the United States. Also, I was brought up as a Russian Orthodox, and I was enriched by its long history as an intricate part of Russian culture. The second person was my college professor back in 1977, Dr. Paul Average. I so wanted to be a Russian history professor, but Dr. Average said my Russian was strictly kuchni ruski, or kitchen Russian, and that just wasn't good enough. So I moved on. But I always kept my love for the subject. Now with the advent of podcasting, I'm able to share my love of Russian history. But before we go on, let me apologize ahead of time if I butcher some of the names and places from Russian history. It's not my native language, and some of these spellings are just incredibly difficult to pronounce. But let's go on this trip. So from Rurik to Putin and all in between. Join me for what I hope is a fun ride. And just so you know, I'm planning that when I'm done with Putin, I expect to continue with the podcast, venturing off to the people who weren't rulers, as well as covering events and places in more depth than the Rulers podcast. In case you're wondering how I know that, I'm already actually doing podcast number 89, and I'm trying to re-record all my podcasts to get better quality having gotten new equipment and i'm already into uh khrushchev so let's get on so just who are the russians well the debates on the origins of the people known as the rus are legendary the first traceable people that populated southern russia were peoples known as slovenes and cimmeranians of whom we know little of although later they were known as slavs They were considered a peaceful people, blue or gray-eyed, tall, fair-skinned, who lived in log homes near many of the rivers and tributaries, and also in the fields of what is now known as the Russian steppes. Because of this, the Slavs were constantly at the mercy of raiding and warlike tribes, like the Scythians from present-day Iran. We have writings from the Greek historian Herodotus from the 5th century BC, which tells us about the Scythian subjugation of the Slavs. From there, the Sumerians from Persia came in the 4th and 3rd century BC. 
and the second century AD, we have a northern invasion from the Goths. This Gothic period lasts for about 200 years. Over the centuries, we have the invasion of the Huns from Asia, and after Attila the Hun's death in 453 AD and the dissolving of his empire, we see the arrival of the Bulgars, who quickly became fully absorbed by the Slavs. Then, in and around 558, we have a cruel and violent band invading known as the Avars. The Avars even threatened Byzantium, as well as campaigning and losing to no less than Charlemagne. Due to their abject cruelty, many Slavs abandoned their homes and moved north. And led by a prince known as Ki, they founded a city named after him, known as Kiev. From here, we see the arrival of the Hazars, who had two leaders, a Kagan, or Great Khan, and the Beg. These warrior peoples were also great traders, and eventually began a spirited trade with the greatest kingdom of the time, Byzantium. The Arabs were now pressing into southern Russian territory, but the Hazars were able to keep them in check from going too far north. There were also many migrations from the north into lands now known as Finland and Lithuania. The people living in the land, soon to be known as Russia, had no currency as wealth was measured by the number of slaves you owned. They also worshipped many pagan gods, with their favorite being Perun, the god of thunder and lightning. There was little formal government, and Christianity was just starting to appear through the missionary work of Kirill, who bought the alphabet known as Kirillic. And now we come to the time where we'll start the discussion of Russian leaders with a legendary man, a Viking known as Rurik. Much of what we know of this man comes from Russian chroniclers who wrote about him two to three hundred years after he died. We will have to take much with a grain of salt, as he was worshipped as a hero like Romans, Romulus, and Remus, so his legend and much of his life was probably greatly exaggerated. Now, Vikings were raiding all over Europe in the 800s AD. They conquered Ireland, Iceland, parts of France and England, and of course the Slavs in the area now known as Russia. These bands of Vikings were not coordinated. As a matter of fact, they often settled in scattered areas and fought against each other in the regions. Rurik was one such Viking who led a group known as the Varangians. Two tales emerge about why Rurik came to the town of Novgorod. One says he was invited by aristocratic Slav merchants to protect them, and the other, more likely to be accurate, was that he was hired out as a guard, but double-crossed his employers, attacking the Novgorodians. Their defense was led by Prince Vadim, but the Varangians crushed him and seized control of the area. The year was 862, and it led to the foundation of the Rurik dynasty that was to rule over the peoples of Russia until the death of Theodore, son of Ivan the Terrible, in 1598, some 736 years later. Rurik's brothers, Askold and Deer, ruled over the town of Kiev, and they wanted to expand their band's holdings. They went so far as to charge down the Dnieper River into the Black Sea to attack, of all places, Constantinople. And this was before Rurik had taken over Novgorod, and it was on June 18th of 860 they began the assault of the heavily fortified town of Constantinople, where they ravaged the countryside because, as luck would have it, Emperor Michael III was off battling the Arabs. Michael, hearing about the invasion, hurried home. While the brothers, hearing of the impending arrival of the Byzantium army and navy, tried to retreat, but their army was decimated by the most powerful kingdom of their time. This defeat shamed the brothers and was to lead to problems for them in the future. By the time of his death in 879, Rurik's kingdom stretched from the Baltic Sea in the north to the southern steppes 
It was a vast region, with many fiefdoms which were to come under the control of the grand princes or dukes of Kiev. In Russian, the Kniaz or Vileki Kniaz, the first of whom was Oleg of Novgorod, who ruled from 879 to 912. Oleg was the regent placed in power because the true heir, Rurik's son Igor, was too young to rule the, the growing nation. Oleg was a cunning man whose Viking name was Helgi. He went about consolidating his power by either forcing the local chiefs to swear allegiance to him, or, if that failed, he simply had them murdered. It was that way with Rurik's brothers, Askold and Deer when he invited them to meet on a boat near Kiev, where he killed the two. This gave him unquestioned rule and allowed him to move the seat of power from Novgorod to Kiev. Oleg is considered the first real ruler of this historical Ukrainian city. From here, Oleg's goal was threefold. First, make Kiev the center of both military and political power. Secondly, he needed to expand trade, especially with the countries surrounding the Mediterranean. The third task was to expand the empire, and that he was going to do with great vigor. Much of what we know about him comes from a variety of sources, which oftentimes contradict each other. One thing we do know about his time was the raid on Constantinople in 907. He ordered his army to ravage the countryside, hoping to put enough pressure on Emperor Leo VI that he would renegotiate their trade agreement with better terms for the Russians. This would take four years when in 911, Leo signed the treaty, which gave the Kievians a preferred trade position. By doing so, Leo was trying to protect his borders and the Russians now could expand their trade into Europe. It is at this time that the Byzantium chroniclers called the land ruled by Oleg as the land of the Rus. It's fascinating to see that there was such a heavy Scandinavian influence on the Rus of the time, as many of the names on the aforementioned trade agreement were not Slavic, but were names like Farulf, Gunnar, Injald, and Karl. Whereas Rurik is considered the founder of the line of rulers, it is Oleg starts what was to become the Russian Empire. Oleg's death, though, is one of legend, and I love this story. A pagan priest had foretold that Oleg would die because of his horse. Being a superstitious man, Oleg sent the horse away. Years later, when he heard of the horse's death, he laughed and went to the site where the horse's bones lie stomped on the head, and out from there a venomous snake bit him, and he subsequently died. Thus ended, mythically, the end of Oleg and the start of the little-known reign of the son of Rurik, Igor. Of the little we do know of Igor was that he also attacked Constantinople, but he did it twice. In his first assault in 941, he met with stiff resistance by the armies of Emperor Romanus I. They were defeated, and their armies were almost completely destroyed. Their navy was annihilated because of a new weapon, Greek fire. This petrochemically-based liquid could burn even when it came in contact with water. This helped rout the Russians and sent them back home with their heads between their tails. A Western chronicler gives this account of the battle. Having become surrounded by the Rus, the Greeks hurled their fire all around them. When the Rus saw this, they at once threw themselves from their ships into the sea, choosing to be drowned by the waves rather than cremated by the fire. Some weighed down by their breastplates and helmets, sank to the bottom. Others were burned as they swam on the waves. The next time, Igor returned in 944 with Pescheneg allies in hand. So Romanus decided against a fight and negotiated a peace. The terms of the trade agreement was worse than the one Oleg had returned with, but nonetheless, Igor knew he couldn't fight the Byzantines and win. 
he returned to Kiev and began to shake down the tribes that paid tribute to him. It was one tribe that had enough that was to end his reign. The Drevelain were a Slavic tribe that was based west of Kiev. One day in the winter of 945, Igor demanded more tribute from them than had been arranged upon. They had had enough. Their prince, Mal, had Igor strung up between two birch trees and had him ripped apart. Thus again, we have another instance where a son of the Grand Prince, this time Sviatoslav, was too young to assume the throne, which forced his mother, Olga, now known as Saint Olga, to be named regent. This was to be a very good thing for the growing empire. Olga was to serve as regent solely, and then sharing power with her son Sviatoslav from 945 to 963. We're not positive about her birth year. Some say 890, others an implausible 879, which it would have made her 56 when her son was born. Not impossible, but in that time of history, highly unlikely. One of the things that makes Olga's reign fascinating is that she is the first Russian ruler to be converted to Christianity, which was to have an enormous influence on the growth and behavior of Russia for the next 1,000 years, and again in today's Russia. It is believed that she converted in 955 and made a pilgrimage to Constantinople in 957, being greeted in a lavish ceremony by Emperor Constantine the Seventh. She was absolutely dazzled by what she saw there, especially what was considered the most beautiful and imposing building in the world, the Hagia Sophia. This church dedicated to Saint Sophia was a marvel of its time, stunning in its beauty. Its magnificence was so amazing that it influenced Russian architecture for the next thousand plus years as well. While Olga was the first Russian ruler to convert, it wasn't until Vladimir I mass converted the people in 988 that the Rus were Christianized. Olga was baptized into Orthodox Christianity when she was a relatively old woman, with Byzantine Emperor Constantine VII serving as her godfather. Her other motive was to negotiate trade agreements with the Byzantine Empire quickly, but she was forced to stay for over a year in Constantinople because of ritual ceremonies which annoyed her to no end. There's a story that when Constantine asked when the gifts she promised were to arrive, she replied that it would be when the emperor would visit Kiev and wait at the palace for as long as she had to wait in Constantinople. While a devout Christian, Olga was no pacifist. To say that she was furious that her husband Igor was murdered by the Drevelain was to put things mildly. The stories of how she enacted her revenge show how brutal she could be. Olga had her armies destroy whole villages, especially the town where Igor died, Iskorotsin. The town was under siege for several months when she offered a moderate surrender payment to be made by the inhabitants, three doves and three sparrows for each household. Legend has it that after receiving the tribute, she ordered that the birds have embers tied to their feet and set free to return to and burn down the previous owner's house. Anyone who ran away from the fires was either killed or sold into slavery. No one was spared. Interestingly enough, Olga was not interested in trying to expand the empire. Her son Sviatoslav was to be entrusted with that. She wanted to streamline government and to change the way tribute was paid so as not to fall into the same trap Igor had by personally collecting the payments. She instituted the system of poludzi, which called for regional depots to be run by appointed officials, basically tax collectors. Olga, for all her love of her newfound religion, was unable to convince her, Slav, her son Sviatoslav or the Russian people to convert. Because of this, she set her sights on her grandsons, Vladimir, Oleg, and Yaropolk. The first was to be the one to force the mass conversion of the Russians to Orthodox Christianity. 
on July 11, 969, Olga passed away, leaving her son Sviatoslav to rule on his own. Sviatoslav I was of Scandinavian blood, which may explain his tireless need to expand his empire and charge about fighting perceived and real enemies. Still, he did a lot to distance himself from his northern heritage, such as shaving his beard regularly and becoming the first to have a truly Slavic name. His first conquest was the Hazar Empire, which he easily defeated in battle in 965. Next, he marched on the Ossetians, the Circassians, and the Viachi, making them swear allegiance and pay tribute. Within two years of his conquest of the southern Hazars, the Russian state doubled in size. Because of the power of his army, Byzantium's new leader, Nicephorus Phocas, asked for the Prince of Kiev to help him defeat the Bulgars, which, for a hefty price, Sviatoslav was happy to do. Destroying the Bulgars, he found riches beyond his wildest dreams and decided, much to the chagrin of his mother Olga, to remain in what is now known as Bulgaria and the city of Periaslavik. This move enraged many in Kiev and also worried Nicephorus, as he now was concerned about whether he had made a worse enemy in the Russians. He wouldn't have to worry much longer as he was assassinated on December 10, 969, by his successor, the famous military genius John Semeckis. Semeckis was considered the greatest military leader in Byzantium's history. Going up against him was to be Sviatoslav's biggest mistake. First, the Byzantine emperor offered to pay off Sviatoslav, but that was rejected and instead responded to with a ridiculous counter-demand of an extraordinary payment that Semeskis could just scarcely believe. That was the last straw. Semeskis launched an attack on the Bulgar capital of Little Preslav, where many Russian troops were garrisoned. They were either slaughtered within a day or escaped. Sviatoslav heard of the coming of the Byzantine army, rushed out to fight on the plains near the capital. He was routed easily by better armed men and cavalry of Smeskis. Sviatoslav retreated to the city of Dorishtolom, where he was put under siege for several months until he tried to break out. The battle was fierce and in question until a windstorm blew dust into the eyes of the Russian army and forced Sviatoslav to sue for peace with only a few thousand men left. John Semeskis brilliantly acquiesced and allowed him to leave, hoping that one day they could be counted on as allies. With few men left, they scurried up to Kiev, but were harassed by the Pechenegs. Finally, cornered near the Dnieper River, hundreds of miles away from Kiev, Sviatoslav's army was crushed, with him being hacked to death. Legend has it that his skull cap was used by the Pecheneg leader, Prince Kurya, as a drinking cup. The year was 972. Sviatoslav was a warrior by nature, and thankfully had a mother like Olga who could run the country. With Olga already dead, after his death, his three sons would battle for supremacy. Yaropolk, Oleg, and Vladimir would plunge the country into eight years of civil war. Yaropolk's reign is mostly lost to history. He reigned as Grand Prince of Kiev from 972 to 980. We do know that the first brother he went after was Oleg, who supposedly killed the son of Leut, a senior advisor to Yaropolk. Also, Sveneld, another senior advisor, held a grudge against both Oleg and Vladimir and used this to focus Yaropolk's anger at the two brothers. The Kievian army led by Yaropolk was larger than the combined forces of the two other brothers and was able to defeat Oleg and kill him in a skirmish early on. Vladimir was able to escape and headed to Novgorod, where he found many allies who were opposed to Yaropolk. Gaining strength with both Viking and Slavic allies, as well as recruiting many Finns and Estonians, by 980, Vladimir was ready to make his move. He laid siege to Kiev, which was short-lived as some advisors of Yaropolk betrayed the Kniaz 
and had him murdered as they knew that this mild-mannered grand prince was no match for his ruthless brother. The year was 980. Next time, we discuss the aptly named Vladimir the Great and Sviatopold the Accursed. Well, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Please visit the website RussianRulersHistory.com or go to Facebook and join our Russian Rulers History Podcast Fan Club page where you can leave a comment, make a suggestion, and as always, Dasvidanya i Spasiba Bolshoya. Now moving ahead, we had some problems between the Byzantines and the Hazars. I mean, they were always working together, but then there was a new group that would come down. And this is from the land of the Rus, and we've talked about this, and that's the Varangian Guard. These are the Varangians who came from the north, including Rurik. They would go down, and they would start having their wars with the Hazars around 860 to 880. And this, when Kievan Grand Prince Sviatoslav finally defeated the Hazars, this was the end of that. And they would linger around the people's until about the Mongol invasion, but that was about it. So that's what I've learned so far. When we come to the next episode, episode two, uh, and it's including Vladimir the Great, I really was remiss in saying a lot about him. I've had a lot more information about Vladimir, and that's what we're going to be adding on to the next one. And I'm hoping that on the 10th and the 20th of each month, I'll come up with another one of the episodes. So I hope you enjoyed that. And of course, as always, Das Vidanya i Spasiba Bolshoya.